Okay, so this is a presentation on Introduction to Jewish Roots of Christianity. This is parts one and two. This will be quite extensive, so I hope and pray you get a lot out of it. And there is much to talk about. So when we talk about the Jewish roots of Christianity, sometimes we run into the issue of paradigms because when we learn things about our faith, sometimes they come out of established paradigms. So I have no doubt that in this presentation you will have to wrestle a little bit with the paradigms and the things you've learned and may have to, you may have to rethink some things. And this is a helpful quote here from Ronald Timothy. He says, paradigms can be so strong that they act as psychological filters. We quite literally see the world through our paradigms. Any data that exists in the real world or even in the Bible that does not fit our paradigm will have a difficult time getting through our filters. We are quite literally unable to perceive the facts right before our eyes. Thus, our greatest strengths can become our greatest weaknesses or greatest weakness by not allowing us to see both the need and the opportunity for change. The people who create new paradigms are usually outsiders. They are not part of the established paradigm community. And so as I said, as we go forward here, you probably will have to wrestle with some of the paradigms that you've learned, and you may have to rethink some things. Now, when it comes to resources on this topic, there are plenty that are out there. If you want to get a book that compares some of the differences between Judaism and modern-day Christianity, you can get this book, Irreconcilable Differences, a Learning Resource for Jews and Christians. Or if you want to learn more about the first century, I highly recommend this book, In the Shadow of the Temple, Jewish Influences on Early Christianity. That is an excellent book. Also, uh, two books here by Marvin Wilson. Exploring Our Hebraic Heritage, A Christian Theology for Roots and Renewal, and his book, Our Father Abraham, The Jewish Roots of the Christian Faith, was, which was one of the books I first read. And then Misreading Scripture Through Western Eyes by Randolph uh, Richards and Brandon J. O'Brien. That's an excellent book. So these are just some of the books to get you started on this topic. Wilson's book here, Exploring Our Hebraic Heritage, came out more recently. It's interesting that David Neff, who was a former editor-in-chief of Christianity Today, said this about Wilson's book. He says, as a historical religion, Christianity must own its Jewish origins and live up to the best of that heritage. Marvin Wilson, a pioneer in evangelical Jewish relations, makes a compelling argument for renewing Christian faith by recovering our Hebraic heritage. If only there were more like him, we could have a healthier church. So that is an interesting comment about a book by Wilson called Exploring Our Hebraic Heritage. Neff obviously thinks that it's a much-needed resource. So what do we mean when we say the Jewish roots of Christianity or the Jewish essence of the faith or the Jewish heritage of the faith? What are we talking about? Well, as Marvin Wilson says here in his book, Exploring Our Hebraic Heritage, for years I have reminded my students that Christianity was not invented out of whole cloth, nor did it or originate de novo. Instead, it was a development from Judaism. To understand anything of the depth of biblical Christianity's teachings, one must understand Judaism. This is something particularly difficult for Christians living in the Western world to grasp. Throughout our history, we have tended to be influenced more by Greek and Latin expressions of Christianity than by those of the Semitic world of the East. Very important comment there. We know that 10 years after the ascension of Jesus, the first followers of Jesus were Jewish. We see here in Acts 2, 42 to 47, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and, be and belongings, distributing the proceeds to all, as any had need, and day by day attending the temple every day, breaking bread in their homes, etc., etc. So 
we see, of course, the first followers of Jesus were Jewish. And just to summarize here a few things, for all the years, for all for for years, all the disciples of Yeshua, that's Jesus' Hebrew name, were Jewish. Of course, the New Testament was entirely written by Jews, with the exception of Luke maybe being a Jewish proselyte. The very concept of a Messiah is Jewish. That's just a translation from the Greek word Christos. We'll talk about that as we go on here. Of course, Jesus himself was Jewish, was then is apparently still Jewish. As far as we still know, he never ceased to become, ceased being Jewish. We know that it was Jewish missionaries who brought the gospel to Gentiles, as we read in the book of Acts. We know that Paul, the chief missionary or emissary to the Gentiles, was an observant Jew all his life. We know that the Messiah's atonement is rooted in the Jewish sacrificial system. We know the Lord's Supper, where we get communion from today, is rooted in the Jewish Passover traditions. We know the entire New Testament is built on the Hebrew Bible with its prophecies and its promise of a new covenant. So it's virtually impossible to learn anything about our faith today without understanding the Jewish roots of Christianity. To ignore this issue is going to be a disaster to one's own theological system. Even Michael Kruger, who is a reform scholar, says right here in his book Christianity at the Crossroads, he says, there's little doubt that the earliest Christians were in fact Jews. They believed that Jesus of Nazareth was a long awaited Jewish Messiah who would fulfill God's extensive promises to Israel and usher in the kingdom of God. Thus Jesus was understood quite naturally within those categories, within these categories. Sure something new is happening with Jesus, the inauguration new covenant as we see in Luke 22:20. 20. But the first Christians would not have conceived of this as the beginning of an entirely new religion. On the contrary, they would have seen it as a completion of something very old, namely the story of God's dealings with Israel. Thus, early Christians were quite content, at least at first, to continue worshiping the temple and following the laws of Moses. It's a very important comment, and that's a good book to get hold of. So we need to remember that like a number of... Uh, first century Jewish sects or parties such as the Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes, the early Jewish followers of Jesus, the sect of the Nazarenes, were just another expression among the various Judaisms of that day. You see that in Acts 24, 5. Of course, the early mission, Paul and the apostles, their habit was to first visit the synagogue to go to the Jew first and preach the good news in almost every center in the uh, cities they entered. We see the apostles continue to go to the temple. As Kruger just said, they went to the synagogue and observed the feasts and the Torah. And this means that today, for us as Christians, we may need to reexamine our stance towards Israel, the Jewish people, the Bible, and of course, the important missional concept to the Jew first. Now, there are some issues about perceptions because we know that a lot of things that we believe are based on perceptions. And some of the common perceptions Christians have of Judaism and Jewish things are, first of all, the fear of Judaizing. Anytime you bring up Jewish roots of Christianity, they start talking about Judaism. They automatically think of the book of Galatians, and they assume Paul was against the Judaizers, and that means Paul is against all Jewish things, because Judaizing meant to be against all Jewish things. And that's unfortunate, because that is a misreading of the book of Galatians. Um, secondly, of course, sometimes Christians read the interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees, and they assume Jesus is against Jewish things or against Judaism because he fights with the Pharisees or argues with them, and the word Pharisee means legalist, bigot, or hypocrite, and this means Jesus is against Judaism because it is legalistic, and that's a misunderstanding, once again, between the interaction between Jesus and the Pharisees. Or third, of course, Judaism is about law and legalism, and Christianity is about grace. And then fourth, maybe Jesus came to bring a brand new religion, which is called Christianity, and put an end to Judaism. These are some of the perceptions and misunderstandings Christians have about Judaism and Jewish things. They can all be corrected, and they have been corrected, but some Christians still are wrapped up in these paradigms, and they haven't thought through them clearly. Now, also, Jewish people have a perception of Christianity, of course, and there's some misunderstanding here as well. Uh, 
Of course, many Jewish people think Jesus is the, is the reason behind hundreds of years of anti-Semitism. There is a long history of anti-Semitism in the church, and many Jewish people trace it back to Jesus as being the starting point for that. Number t or Secondly, some Jewish people think that maybe Jesus was a Torah-observant Jew, but Paul came along and broke away from Jesus and started a new religion called Christianity. That's inaccurate as well. And then third, of course, they perceive Christianity as only being concerned about the afterlife, not being concerned about the here and now. And then fourth, Christianity is more about the creed, while Judaism is more about the deed or action. So many Jewish people view Christianity as about creedal belief, whereas Judaism is more about orthopraxy or action. Now, obviously, these are misunderstandings as well, and we've corrected uh, these things. So both sides need to look into their perceptions and maybe rethink some of these issues. Some people, as I said before, assume that the Old Testament is about Judaism and Jewish history, where in the New Testament, that's about Christianity, and that's when Christianity begins. That is a complete misreading of the Bible. As what we want to think of is that this, as I have a chart in this format, we need to think as the First Testament instead of Old Testament is the Tanakh or the Jewish Scriptures is about Jewish history. And then the Second Testament is Jewish history as well. It's the Brit Kaddishah New Testament, but... We want to think probably in terms of First and Second Testament instead of Old and New Testament. If we think Old and New Testament or think in those categories, sometimes that breaks the Testaments up and breaks the continuity of the Bible. So perhaps we want to rethink it in this format. And then, of course, when the average Christian hears the word church, they sometimes assume that this means Christian church and everything Israel was called to do has now been fulfilled, completed, or transferred to the Christian church. In other words, perhaps Jesus or Paul brought Christianity and ended Judaism. And then, of course, Christians read their current ecclesiastical tradition back into the New Testament, and they assume there was one Judaism in the first century, and then Christianity came along and replaced it. And that's just a misunderstanding as well. The reality of it is, the way it was in the first century, you had many Judaisms. You didn't have one strand of Judaism, and you had different sects of Judaism, as Josephus talks about in his writings. You have the Essenes, you have the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Zealots. Of course, some of these sects are mentioned within the New Testament. You have the followers of Jesus referred to the sect of the Nazarene in the book of Acts. And then we have discovered that we have possibly 20 sects total or even groups or subgroups. And so that's quite helpful in understanding the first century. Even James Dunn says here, who's a New Testament scholar, he says prior to Paul, what we now call Christianity was no more than a messianic sect within first century Judaism or better within second temple Judaism. They were called the sect of the Nazarenes, the followers of the way. And then of course, through history, a long messy history we see that the first followers of jesus eventually as time went on become more of a gentile based religion a gentile based faith and we see that christianity becomes a totally separate religion outside of the jewish world and we know several centuries later we have the formation of protestantism evangelicalism we have roman catholicism eastern orthodoxy and all the different Christian denominations. And then in the middle here, we see that the Pharisees or Pharisaical Judaism evolves into rabbinic Judaism. And today, of course, in the Jewish community, we have different branches of Judaism. We have Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform, and even Humanistic or Reconstructionist Judaism. But none of those branches existed in the first century. So this is part of what we call the parting of the ways, and that takes a long study in itself and there's a lot of complex factors to lead to where we are today and so that is the way we have it today and this is the way many christians and jewish people like it because we have sort of this separation and some boundaries or borders in place where christianity is its own religion with its different denominations and judaism is its own faith as well with its different branches and this is the way many people see it today but that is not the way it was in the first century
And of course, by the early 300s, when Constantine converted to Christianity, he legalized it and began to promote it. And that's when Christianity became a religion of the empire and where Christianity really became an institutionalized religion. Yes, Judaism was acknowledged as a separate religion, and some uh, Jewish people were permitted to survive, but there was certainly degrading persecution that started towards Jewish people. In some cases, they were forced to convert to Christianity. Now, today we have plenty of Messianic Jews. There's a book called Introduction to Messianic Judaism, and Messianic Jews today are nothing new. It's not a new thing. They are a continuation on of the first century Jewish disciples of Jesus. And there are several fellowships across this world or Messianic congregations. And of course, we know we have many cross-cultural congregations such as Korean, Spanish, or Russian speaking, or culturally or uh, congregations have a focus on cultural ethnicity. And so those are the same things. That's the same thing that's happening with the Messianic congregations. They're congregations of Jews who believe in Jesus. They want to maintain a Jewish identity. And they also have Gentiles in them as well, because as we know in the first century, Jews and Gentiles are coming together to worship Jesus. So it's not a brand new thing. And I encourage you to get this book. Remember, Messianic Judaism or Messianic congregations are not the same thing as the Hebrew Roots movement. And we want to make sure we differentiate between those two things. Now, let's talk a little bit about the church Israel terminology. The word church is a translation from the word ecclesia. And we know the word ecclesia is used by Paul in reference to local congregations or gatherings of people who believe in the Messiah, either an entire region or city collectively. Ecclesia could also be used as a designation for what we call synagogue institutions. And in the Greco-Roman societies, Ecclesia referred to public assemblies. And in the, the course, your English translations translates it into assembly as well. So the point is that we want to be careful because we don't want to assume that when Jesus came to bring a church, people think the word church has to do with Christian church. And so let's remember what Craig Evans says right here. Did Jesus intend... To found the Christian church, an interesting question can be answered in the affirmative and the negative. It depends on what precisely is being asked. If by church, one means an organization and a people that stand outside of Israel, the answer is no. If by community of disciples committed to the restoration of Israel and the conversion and instruction of the Gentiles, then the answer is yes. And that's why we have so many books here, as I talked about before, on the parting of the ways. This one on the far left, How Judaism and Christianity Became Two, is a good book. James Dunn book from a ways back on the parting of the ways dealt with that topic. And then a book called The Ways That Never Parted, Jews and Christians in Late Antiquity and the Early Middle Ages, talked a lot about the relationship between Jews and non-Jews, or Jews who believe and non-Jews who didn't believe and Gentile Christians, and they think that honestly they used to interact with each other on through the second, third century. So they're not exactly sure we have an official parting, and that is still debated, but most likely there were some complex factors in place within the first century, and then things began to get more heated in the second, third, fourth centuries as Christianity became a Gentile-based faith. And so you can get those books if you want to read deeper on that topic or go deeper on that topic. And as Evan says right here, the estrangement of the Church of Israel was not the result of Jesus' teaching or Paul's teaching. Rather, the parting of the ways that has been called in recent years was a result of a long process. And that is quite uh, true. That is very true. So we want to read those resources there I just gave and understand that was a long, messy process. Let's talk a little bit about Jesus in Jewish context and Jesus as a Jewish Messiah. This is a great quote here by Anthony Sardarni. Sardarni. He says here, does Jesus the Jew as a Jew have any impact on Christian theology and on Jewish Christian relations? To wrench Jesus out of the Jewish world, out of his Jewish world, destroys Jesus and destroys Christianity. The religion that grew out of his teachings, even Jesus' most familiar role as Christ, is a Jewish role. 
If Christians leave the concrete realities of Jesus' life and of the history of Israel in favor of a mythic, universal, spiritual Jesus and an otherworldly kingdom of God, they deny their origins in Israel, their history, and the God who loved and protected Israel and the church. They cease to interpret the actual Jesus sent by God and remake him into their own image and likeness. The dangers are obvious. If Christians violently wrench Jesus out of his natural, ethnic, and historical place, Within the people of Israel, they open the way to doing equal violence to Israel in the place and people of Jesus. It's a very, very important quote. And as Michael Bird says here, Jesus is not an ahistorical religious icon who can be deciphered entirely apart from any historical situation. On the contrary, he could not have been born as savior of the world somewhere in the Amazon rainforest or in the Gobi Desert. He came to Israel and through Israel to make good God's promises to save the world through a renewed Israel. So whether we like it or not, we are obligated to study Jesus in his historical context. I would go so far as to say that this is even a necessary task of discipleship. And this plays a role when we read things such as the Apostles' Creed, because if you read the Apostles' Creed, which is read in many churches, you'll notice here, some things are said about Jesus' earthly life a little bit. It talks about his crucifixion under Pontius Pilate. It talks about he suffered, died, and was buried and rose from the dead. And, of course, there's other statements here about um, you know, some theological statements. But at the end of the day, after reading this, you really wouldn't know much about Jesus' Jewish background at all. You wouldn't know he's the son of David. You wouldn't know much about his relationship with Israel. So the creed falls a little short here, and some of these creeds need to be rethought. Um, and just maybe we need to think about what we're saying when we say these creeds. Do we understand the entire earthly life of Jesus if it's not related to Israel? And so when we do historical theology, we look at the creeds. But as I just said, if you look at the Apostles' Creed and even the Nicene Creed, they tend to jump from creation and fall straight to Jesus without any mention of, of Jesus's relationship with Israel or the history and people of Israel. So this would be a better layout as far as the narrative of the Bible. If we look at creation and fall, the next thing to do certainly would be look at the story of Israel and the nations because that is what the First Testament is about. And then, of course, the Messiah comes. And then in the new heavens and the new earth, we still have a relationship between Israel and the nations as the king is there on earth. So this would be a better narrative as far as I'm concerned, but some may disagree with me, but that's the way I think it should be taught. Now, why is it so important to get Jesus in his right context? Well, the culture is very confused about who Jesus is. And as I said before, if you don't get him in his right context, you end up making him into your own image. And we see there have been so many pictures of Jesus over the centuries about what people think he is or what he looks like. Some people think he was African-American. Some people think he looks like a English Jesus or a Greek Orthodox Jesus. It just depends. There's been so many depictions of him. But today people are very confused. And we know that there are even Muslims now who are saying Jesus was a Muslim. This is where I live. There is a group called Ask a Muslim. They think Jesus was a Muslim, and they fit him into their uh, image. They think Jesus is certainly just as good as any other Muslim, if not the ultimate Muslim prophet. That's very sad. Then we have the Mormon Jesus, where Mormons think that Jesus was the first procreated as a spirit child of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother, then later conceived of an act of phys physical sexual intercourse between God, the Father, and Mary. Jesus is a spirit brother of Satan and is rather common in terms of his nature. So here we see, other than the Islamic Jesus, we have a Mormon Jesus. And then we have a group called the Black Hebrew or Israelites who go around standing on street corners and preaching to the African-American community that Jesus was black. And they're absolutely convinced Christianity is a white man's religion, and they're out to get African Americans back into where they should be. So they are a cult here in Columbus, Ohio, and other parts of the country. <clears throat> and they think that they are really doing a great job of interpreting the scriptures. But if you look at what they say, they don't even know the basics of hermeneutics. And then, of course, we have the American Jesus, 
We have people trying to fit Jesus into American culture. We have Jesus CEO. We have Jesus as a life coach. And we even have a cookbook about Jesus. What would Jesus eat? And so Jesus is also taken into American culture. We fit him into an image as well in our own culture. And then, of course, we have the Jesus of Democrats or Republicans when it comes to election time. Everybody tries to fit Jesus into their political party, and they think that they're really uh, following who Jesus is by picking a certain political party. And people have a problem with identity politics. Much of their identity is wrapped up in their political views. And so this becomes a problem during each election cycle. And then we have some books that have come out. A very uh, a good a best-selling book was called Zealot by Reza Aslan. He thought that Jesus was certainly a member of a Jewish group in the first century called the Zealots, who was a very political group who wanted to overtake Rome. And to Aslan's credit, he says Jesus was not a Christian. He was a Jew preaching Judaism to other Jews. He was on a Jewish mission, one concerned exclusively the fate of his fellow Jews. Israel is all that mattered to Jesus. He's partially right. But to a certain extent, he's wrong that Jesus was simply a political revolutionary. And so you can read some criticisms or critiques of Zealots, of the book Zealot online. Uh, Aslan relies primarily on the gospel or the Q document informing what he, we can know about Jesus, and that has problems as well. Then we have Rabbi Shmuley here who uh, came out with a book called Kosher Jesus. And he is an Orthodox Jew who emphasized in this book that Jesus was a political leader as well as first century Jews who fought for the liberation of the Jewish people. So he does not see Jesus as divine at all or nor the Jewish Messiah. He just sees Jesus more as a social revolutionary, a political leader as well. And if you want to read a response to that, get Michael Brown's book, The Real Kosher Jesus. So there's some things that we have discovered within the last 50 to 60 years, and that is the fact that we're missing some things about Jesus. And the missing Jesus is Jesus within Judaism. And without understanding Jesus in Jewish context, we're missing an entire dimension of his identity. That means we need to see the context of the Judaism, which was his own natural environment. Now, there have been a slew of books written about this, a ton of books that have been written about this topic. Uh, throughout the last four or five decades, we've had books like E.P. Sanders, Jesus and Judaism, or The Jewish Reclamation of Jesus. Even The Missing Jesus, Rabbinic Judaism in the New Testament is another one. We've had uh, Gezer Vermesh write books called Jesus the Jew and Jesus in Jewish Context. We've had Brad Yun's book, Jesus and the Jewish Theologian, and even... Amy Jill Levine, who's an Orthodox Jew who teaches at Vanderbilt, who's not a follower of Jesus, has written a book called The Misunderstood Jew, The Church and the Scandal of the Jewish Jesus. And she thinks that Jesus definitely needs to be studying the Jewish context. She wants her own people to read the New Testament. So she's worth looking at as well, kind of interesting perspective. We have other books here called uh, Jesus Was a Jew by Arnold Fruchtenbaum. There's a great book here in the middle I have called Who is Jesus? A Jewish Christian Dialogue that has a series of essays from, Jew, from uh, Jewish scholars and Christian scholars on who they think Jesus was. And then Ben Witherington's book, The Jesus Quest, Quest which came out a long time ago, critiques the different approaches to Jesus uh, that have come out, the different Jesus scholars that have published books. He kind of assesses all those in that book called The, Search, uh, the Jesus Quest, The Third Search for the Jew of Nazareth. Now, most recently, there have been a couple books that have come out. Uh, this book called The Forgotten Jesus, How Western Christians Should Follow the Eastern Rabbi by Rabbi Galati, Galati. And then The Jewish Jesus, How Judaism and Christianity Shaped Each Other by Peter Schaefer. So there's more than enough resources out there to study Jesus within his historical and Jewish context. But remember that there's more to learn about Jesus than simply that he takes us to heaven when we die. If that's all you care about when looking at Jesus, then you've really missed a good chunk of the Bible and the original context that he gave his teachings in. Now, someone that's written a lot of books about trying to get Jesus back within a Jewish context is N.T. Wright. His books have been very popular. His series on 
uh, Christian origins such as Jesus and the victory of God and the resurrection, the Son of God, and the challenge of Jesus. He tries to understand Jesus within Second Temple Judaism. He talks about Jesus' aims. Why did he die? How did the early ecclesia begin? He's very correct. He's, he's correct in getting Jesus in his right context, but some of his exegetical conclusions I don't agree with, but still he's done a lot to try to store Jesus within a Jewish context. So let's talk a little bit about Jesus and the Judaism of his day. What sect did Jesus belong to? We talked about some of these sects here, such as the Essenes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Zealots. All these sects affirm there's one God alone in contrast to the multiple of deities in the pagan world. We know that's part of the Shema in Deuteronomy 6, 4 about Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. We know these sects all believe the Torah was central to their faith. That's the law. We know that they believe in the centrality of the temple and the Sabbath observance and the Jewish holiday cycle. And we know that when we're talking about Second Temple Judaism, the time of Jesus, that is the time period between the construction of the Second Temple in Jerusalem in 515 BCE and its destruction by the Romans in 70 CE. So we just want to understand, to understand Jesus or Paul, we need to study the Second Temple Jewish period. That's what we're talking about in Second Temple Judaism. There have been a couple books or more than two books, but these two I recommend if you want to study the Second Temple period, Jewish Backgrounds of the New Testament by J. Julius Scott and an Introduction to Second Temple Judaism. So I highly recommend that you learn about the Second Temple period. That'll help you understanding what was going on in some of the backgrounds of Jesus' and Paul's teachings. Now let's talk a little about the Pharisees. That sect's name apparently derives from the Hebrew word parash, which means to separate. Parash, which means to separate. They certainly were the most influential sect of the Jews, and one of their chief characteristics was they were devoted to the Torah, the law, and its interpretation, and to living life as closely as possible according to the Torah. We know we read in Acts 23.8, as Paul says, he's a Pharisee, that the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead. We know in Jesus' time, most of the scribes are Pharisees, but not all Pharisees had the theological skill demanded of a scribe. And then we have the Sadducees, which are mentioned in the Gospels as well. They were leaders of the temple establishment in Jesus' time, and it was the Sadducees who were most directly threatened by Jesus' message and popularity. We know they constitute a small aristocratic sect from the highest economic stratum of Judean society. And we know, thirdly, they rejected the idea of the resurrection of the dead because we know that Jesus says to them at one point that he is the, or the God is the God of the living. And, of course, he talks about how I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He quotes that to them. We know that, fourth, while the Pharisees were adaptive in their approach to the Torah interpreting regulations as literally, figuratively, or loosely as the case might be, the Sadducees were rigid adherents of the plain sense of Scripture. And then we have the Essene sect, and that's where we get the Dead Sea Scrolls from. The Dead Sea Scrolls were some scrolls that were found in the 1940s in Israel, in the Dead Sea Scroll area, or in the uh, Dead Sea area. We know that this sect never appears in the New Testament. We don't have any evidence that they were talked about in the New Testament, but there were some theories that maybe Jesus or John the Baptist were part of the Essenes because the Essenes were seen as an apocalyptic sect that separated from Jerusalem, the religious establishment. They thought they needed to live a life of purity, and they set up a bunch of purity laws. And they were a Jewish sect who broke away from the establishment. And this is a great book to look at called Communities of the Last Days, because some of the things the Essenes say in their writings and some of the scrolls, you can see some similarities in the New Testament. Even their messianic expectations are listed in the scrolls. And so... That's certainly, uh, they were certainly a very important find in the history of archaeology. There's been a ton of books written about it, but we don't have any strong evidence that Jesus wasn't a scene or John the Baptist wasn't a scene, even if John the Baptist was out in the desert. So that's something to study in your own time as well. Now, the Zealots were a group of nationalists, and we know that Josephus, Josephus refers to the Zealots as the fourth Jewish philosophy. They certainly believed the God of Israel was the only king that the Jews would acknowledge. 
They thought they would establish God's reign by rooting out paganism, by breaking the yoke of tyranny. And they thought the Torah made a separation from Gentiles and exalted Israel as the chosen people of God and promised triumph. We know their main concern was for the national and religious life of the Jewish people. And we know that they, there were certainly many Messianic revolts at the time of Jesus, and generally it was led by someone who was a zealot. But we have no strong evidence that Jesus was a zealot as well. If anything, he was the bit of the opposite. And then, of course, we have the Hebraic and Hellenistic wing of Judaism at the time, or sometimes they call it Palestinian Judaism and Hellenistic Judaism. The Hebrews were the Jews who retained the Jewish faith and also made great use of the Hebrew or Aramaic language and Jewish customs. In contrast, the Hellenists were a little more, uh, of course, exposed to the Greek culture. They absorbed the Greco-Roman culture, and they spoke Greek, and they adapted some of the customs of the neighbors at the time of the Greek culture, and sometimes resembled Jewish neighbors. And we read about this in Acts chapter 6, when we read about how the Hellenists and the Hebrews had a debate about how to deal with Stephen there. So if you want to read Acts chapter 6, that's the background there. Now the question becomes, as James Charlesworth says here, and he answers, I think, in the, I think he answers it correctly. He says, was Jesus an Essene, a Pharisee, a Zealot, or a Sadducee? This question also is now exposed as uninformed. Jesus was certainly no Zealot or Sadducee. He was close in many ways to the Essenes and especially some Pharisees, but he was neither an Essene nor a Pharisee. Jesus was influenced by some Essene ideas and many Pharisaic thoughts, but he was certainly not an Essene, but he was not an Essene or Pharisee, let alone a Zealot or Sadducee. He was unique and gave rise to a new Jewish sect, and I would have to agree with Charles Worth there. So a little bit more about Jesus' relationship to the Judaism of his day. We know that Jesus' parents are obedient to the Torah by having him circumcised on the eighth day. We know that Jesus participated in mikvah, is where, which is where we get baptism from. We know that Jesus bore a common Jewish name, which is Yeshua. That means he, God, saves or God saves. We know that Jesus presupposed the validity of the temple, the sacrifices, and Jewish holy days. We know that the Feast of Tabernacles is mentioned in John 7, that the Feast of Passover is mentioned in the background in Matthew 26 when Jesus is about to be crucified. We know that the Feast of Dedication, which is where we get Hanukkah from, is the background in John chapter 10. We know that Jesus taught in the synagogue. Jesus debated other rabbis. He wept over Jerusalem. So we see plenty uh, about the relationship and the Jewish background of Jesus' life in the Gospels themselves. We know that Jesus is called rabbi by his disciples and others. We know his closest followers are called disciples or Talmudim, which means learner or student. And of course, when we become followers of Jesus, we become disciples or Talmudim as well. We know that Jesus viewed himself as being revealed in the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. We know he taught the Old Testament, or the First Testament was authoritative. Of course, he quotes from the Torah and his temptation in the wilderness. We know he quotes from Exodus seven times, Isaiah eight times, Deuteronomy ten times, the Psalms eleven times. He also quotes from other parts of the First Testament or Old Testament throughout his ministry. We know that in Matthew 1, it talks about Jesus' Jewish ethnicity or lineage. It talks about the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. We know that Hebrews 7.14 said, It is clear that our Lord descended from Judah, which means Jesus descended from the tribe of Judah, which is where we get the name Jew. Now let's talk a little bit about the Messiah issue. Many, many Christians and many, many sermons always mention the name Jesus Christ. We challenge people to accept Jesus as our Savior or as their Savior. We say we follow Jesus Christ. We say that we need to preach the Lord Jesus Christ. But sometimes you just have to wonder if when we say Jesus Christ, if people think that Jesus is walking around in the first century saying, Hi, I'm Jesus. My last name is Christ and my parents' names are Mr. and Mrs. Christ. Perhaps in the temple they were saying, Hello, Mr. and Mrs. Christ. Your son Jesus is in the temple. Come and pick him up. Well, 
No, that's not true at all, of course. We know that Jesus Christ, is this a translation from Yeshua HaMashiach, which means Jesus is the Messiah? Jesus the Messiah, of course. The name Jesus is a Greek form of the Hebrew name Yeshua, right? And that's, of course, of course we get the Hebrew word. From the Hebrew word, we get the name Joshua, and that means salvation. And so we probably want to think a little more about what we mean when we say Jesus Christ. We probably should say Jesus is the Christ or Jesus is the Messiah. But under, to understand the word Messiah means we need to understand their history of the relationship of the word Messiah with Israel. We know the word Christian appears three times in the New Testament, Acts 11, 26, 26, 28, 1 Peter 4, 16. But we know that Paul prefers to refer to the followers of Jesus as the, or the Jewish sect. He prefers to them as the way. We know Paul never refers to himself as a Christian, nor does he ever use the word Christian in his letters. And if you were a Christian or you called yourself a Christian, that referred to someone within Jewish synagogue communities that embrace Gentiles. You were part of the Jewish world and had nothing to do with referring to ethnicity but commitment to Jesus as the Messiah. And once again, when we think of the word Jesus Christ or think of it when we say we follow Jesus Christ or the phrase Jesus Christ, remember the most comparable New Testament Greek word is Christos, which is where we get the English word Christ from. The Hebrew word Mashiach, means anointed one is where we get the word messiah from and as i said messiah means anointed one which is derived from verbs that mean to rub something or to anoint someone and we read throughout the jewish scriptures where prophets priests and kings were anointed for a specific purpose in the jewish scriptures of course we sometimes read about a specific individual anointed future figure such as in daniel 9 who will come who is called uh, who is so, someone who's called the anointed one and so the anointed one So just remember if we're going to understand the Messiah topic. We have to start with the Jewish scriptures Now we know with the Messianic expectations at the time of Jesus there were several Messianic expectations There wasn't just one We now know that there seems to be a transcendent or divine Messiah expectation because We see the emphasis on the Son of Man throughout the New Testament that, of course, comes from Daniel 7.13 and some of the books or the apocryphal books in First Enoch. We know that Jesus uses, uses Son of Man and his ministry continually talks about himself as a Son of Man. We know there seems to be an expectation of a prophetic Messiah like Moses, as we see in the book of John. We know that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22 to 24, the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. There seems to be an expectation for a miracle working Messiah. And we know the Qumran community or the Essenes that predated Jesus thought there were possibly two messiahs, one priestly and one royal. And so we don't want to think there's just one messianic expectation at the time of Jesus. That's a bit of an oversimplification. Now let's talk a little bit about Jesus and the restoration of Israel. This is a very important topic. Yes, there have been other books, and plenty of books have been written on this topic as well. As I mentioned in T. Wright before, he's talked a lot about that in his series on Christian origins. And then there's been critiques on Wright, such as the book here, Jesus and the Restoration of Israel. There's some other books here about Jesus's Israel's, it says Jesus and Israel's tradition of judgment and restoration. Even Jewish scholar John Levinson's writ written a book called Resurrection, the Restoration of Israel. He talks about how Israel's restoration was related directly to the resurrection theme within the Jewish scriptures. And that lays a very important background for understanding what is happening within the New Testament. I just want to mention that. And then there's a book called For the Nation, which talks about Jesus and whether he had any interest in territorial restoration his ministry. So we don't want to skip over this because there has been a lot of work in New Testament scholarship on this topic, and it's very important. But what do we mean when we say Israel? Do we mean Israel the people, Israel the land? Or do we mean Israel as a political entity or a nation state or a royal monarchy under the rule of David or Saul and their descendants? Whenever you bring up you love Israel or you don't like Israel or what do you mean about Israel, make sure you're clarifying what you mean here. 
Now, when it comes to Israel's election, this is a very important quote here from Scott Bader Say here. It's very important in his book, The Church After Israel, After Christendom, The Politics of Election. He says here, election is the choice by one person of another person out of a range of possible candidates. This choice then establishes a mutual relationship between the elector and the elected. In biblical terms, a covenant, berit, election is much more than fundamental than just freedom of choice. In the ordinary sense where a free person chooses to do one act from a range of possible acts, instead the elector chooses another person with whom she will both act and elicit responses and then establishes a community in which these acts are done and then promises that for which the election has occurred. So we see that we need to understand the issue of election because some people say the Jewish people are chosen or Israel's chosen. A better word is probably election. And I think this is a good choice, word choice here in understanding what election is. Now, what was Israel elected to do? Well, they certainly elected to be a holy people. We know that. God wanted them to be holy and separate from the nations and be unique in their holiness. We know they're called to be a kingdom of priests. We know they're called to be a redeemed people. When God delivered them out of Egypt, he redeemed them, and they're supposed to tell future generations about that redemption. We know they're called to be a light to the nations, that the other nations are supposed to be drawn to them. We know that they were called to bring the scriptures to the world, as Paul talks about in Romans 3, 2. And we know, we read in Romans 15, 8 to 9, that it was through the nation of Israel the Messiah would come to Israel, but also he would help Israel fulfill their calling to the nations as well. And so these are just some of the things Israel is elected to do. You can study this in greater detail, but that's just a general overview. So Israel's election has to do with God's plans, of course, because God uses Israel and the nations together. God's plans are national with Israel, but as a nation, they're supposed to bring international blessings. They're supposed to bring the light to the nations, and the nations are supposed to bless Israel. It's not one way or the other. They go together. And, of course, Israel's head is their Messiah. Their ideal representative of Israel is their Messiah, that being Jesus. And he comes to restore Israel and use Israel as a nation to bring blessings to the other people groups of the world, blessings that are both spiritual and physical. And that is very interesting because we know that in Jesus' ministry, it seems that Jesus is a bit of a nationalist. He doesn't spend a lot of time talking or focusing on anyone other than Israel. Not a lot of strong evidence for it. Maybe a couple texts you can point to, a few texts. But overall, he keeps focused. On, he stays focused on reaching his own people. For example, Matthew 10, 5 to 6, he tells his disciples do not go among the Gentiles or any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He says to the woman he's healing, Matthew 15, 24, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we see, of course, though, that Jesus does teach his disciples that they will bear witness to governors and kings, which means they're probably not going to be talking to Jews, they're probably Gentiles. And of course, we know Matthew 28, 19, Jesus commands his disciples to then take the light or the gospel to the nations. After all, Israel was called to be a light to the nations. And Jesus is going to follow the pattern of mission in the Old Testament. Now, this is an interesting comment by Michael Goen here. He says, why was Jesus only focused on Israel? He says here, since God has chosen Israel to be a light to the nations and Israel has been judged for its failure, God's plan for the last days is first to gather and restore Israel and then to draw Gentiles into this covenant family. We have to do... We have, to do, we have to deal with two successive events, first the call to Israel and subsequently the redemptive incorporation of the Gentiles into the kingdom of God. It is first of all a matter of winning Israel for the gospel, then Israel believing will become a light to the nations. Thus Jesus' apparent particularism is an expression of his universalism. It is because his mission concerns the whole world that he comes to Israel.
And once again, remember the Evans quote here. This ties in with this. Did Jesus intend to found the Christian church? This interesting question can be answered in the affirmative and the negative. It depends on what precisely is being asked. If by church one means an organization and a people that stand outside of Israel, the answer is no. But if by a community of disciples committed to the restoration of Israel and the conversion and instruction of the Gentiles, the answer is yes. We already read that one. We will skip that. And so what was Jesus trying to do in bringing restoration to Israel? What was his vision for the Judaism of his day? Well, was he trying to bring renewal to Israel? Of course, we see that the evidence is he was trying to bring some sort of renewal. But what does that mean? Was he bringing an end to Judaism and forming an entirely new religion called Christianity? And what does this mean when we re read Acts 1-6 where Peter says to Jesus, so when they came together, Peter asked him, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? So let's talk about that a little bit here. We know the immediate context of Acts 1, 7 to 8, or 6, 7, and 8, have to do with the disciples' question and the answer given by Jesus. Remember, Jesus had just spent 40 days with them. We weren't there to witness that. We don't know everything he taught, but we do read that he talked a lot about the kingdom of Israel to them, and we sometimes uh, read this passage about how Jesus responds to Peter, and some read it as this way, that Jesus' answer to him in the passage is about an uh, implicit postponement of what the disciples are supposedly looking for. And of course, we see in Acts 1 there that Jesus redirects their attention in the immediate future, because he talks about a universal mission empowered by the Holy Spirit. He tells them not to worry about the times or seasons or the dates about when he will return or restore Israel. So he doesn't necessarily say to them, you're so stupid for asking about the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. But he just talks about uh, the, the mission that's going to need to be started. So it seems like it's seen as a postponement there to some people. Or another way people read it is that the answer given by Jesus is seen as a rebuke. And he's trying to change the topic as to what the disciples were looking for. After all, they had just spent all that time with him and he was resurrected. And how can they possibly then ask, are you going to restore Israel now? It seems like they're not understanding what Jesus is doing. So perhaps they're wrongheaded in asking that and Jesus is correcting them. And... Another question is, number two here, is Jesus saying they've misunderstood the universal emphasis of the mission of Jesus and are still stuck purely with nationalistic and political views of the kingdom? This is what Peter would be talking about when he thinks of a restored Israel or the disciples thinking of a restored kingdom of God. All these passages were talked about within the Jewish scriptures about how Jerusalem would be at the center of the earth and how Israel would be blessed and how their Messiah would rule from the throne there in Jerusalem. And so they understood what a restored Israel meant. It means they're living in peace in their homeland. They're not under Roman rule. And so the question becomes, was Jesus correcting them about thinking about this restoration or having a kingdom then? Was he saying to them, how dare you ask for such a thing? I've already corrected you. Or was he simply saying, don't worry about that right now. Get on to preaching the gospel. The restoration will happen at a later date. Now, as I said, we talked about Acts 1, 6, or about restoring the kingdom. If you read the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, we see that word for restoration or the concept of restore refers to God's political restoration of Israel. Third, that same theme is seen in Acts 3.21 when Peter is preaching to the Jewish people after Jesus has been ascended or has ascended to the Father. And Peter talks about that restoration theme as well. For right here, we can look at it right here in Acts 3, 17 to 21. He says here, he's preaching to the Jewish people after Jesus has ascended. He says, and now, brethren, you acted in ignorance just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced 
beforehand by the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. He has thus fulfilled, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord that he may send Jesus the Messiah appointed for you from heaven and who must receive, heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke about through his holy prophets from ancient time. Now, I just went over some of the passages in the Old Testament that the prophets spoke about as far as the restoration of Israel. But Peter is saying, if they repent, God will send the Messiah back and then the restoration will start. That restoration theme that was talked about in the prophets. And that same restoration, that same word for restoration is used in Acts 1 when Peter asked Jesus about will he restore the kingdom of Israel. And as I said here, the Greek word for restoration is the same word that's used in the Septuagint for God's future return of the Jews from all over the world. We read about this in passages, some passages in Jeremiah here. And Peter is most likely referring to a future renewed earth that will feature Israel and the nations. And so I think what we need to take away from Acts 1 is that Jesus is not saying they're wrong for asking about the restoration of of the kingdom of God or the restoration of Israel, but perhaps it is postponed for the future. And this brings up an interesting point. Is Luke emphasizing what's called inaugurated eschatology? An inaugurated eschatology, in inaugurated eschatology, that theme is what we call already but not yet. That means that the reign of God has started but is not been fully consummated yet and will not be fully consummated until the return of Jesus. And so that means that the reign of God or the kingdom of God has started. It has been inaugurated, but is not completed. It will be completed at the second coming. And so we are living in inaugurated eschatology. A little chart here would help. We see here in the first coming in the middle here, Jesus' first coming is the already theme. That Jesus came as the son of David. He performed miracles. He was exalted to the right hand of God. He's reigning over the earth. The message of salvation and the messianic salvation is extended to Gentiles. But we also see part of it's not been completed yet. The not yet part on the far right is when Jesus will reign from the earth. There will be peace in the nations. Israel will be at peace. And there will be international harmony. And so that restoration of Israel in the future could be something that does happen in the not yet phase. Depending on your eschatology, I think the Bible does teach inaugurate eschatology. Obviously, good Christians disagree about this issue, but I think Luke is going for inaugurated theme in his writings. Jesus also talked about the restoration of Israel, Matthew 19, 28. He talks about, truly, I say to you that you follow me in the regeneration. When the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also will sit upon the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. We know in the context of that chapter has to do with rewards in the kingdom. They're asking him about who will sit where and what kind of rewards they will have. But Jesus talks about them sitting on the Davidic throne with the restored twelve tribes of Israel ruled by the twelve apostles. And so there is some sort of restorative theme in that passage. And that would take some unpacking as well for a later date. Let's finish up here a little more about Jesus and his vision for the Judaism of his day. And let's uh, expand a little bit on the reign of God or the kingdom of God. We know that Jesus' main message was the kingdom of God. He said that in Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel, the good news. We know that Jesus linked his miracles and exorcisms to the proclamation of the kingdom of God. He says here, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons and the kingdom of God has come upon you. We know, as we said right here, we talked about inaugurate eschatology. The kingdom of God is already, but not yet. In Jewish thinking, there's two ages, this age and the age to come. We know there's a tension point between the present and the future. 
And I think that's what we see in the Gospels and in Acts as well, that the kingdom is already here, but it's also in the future. It started, but it's not fulfilled yet. And we live in a tension point between the present and the future. The exact expression of kingdom of God, of course, is not found within the First Testament or Old Testament. Of course, the idea of God's reign or kingship is found. We know that God declares to his people, I am the Lord, your holy one, Israel's creator, your king, in Isaiah 43, 15. We know that, sec we know that uh, thirdly, after God demonstrates his kingly power in splitting the waters of the Red Sea, Moses sings, the Lord will reign forever and ever. We know that the verb reign means that God reigns eternally for his kingship is established throughout his redeeming acts of deliverance. And so we see the theme all throughout the Jewish scriptures about how God is a king and he reigns over the earth and he reigns from the heavens. And of course he uses his agents or prophets or representatives to bring his reign on earth. We know that Jesus also talked about the name or something else he did in the Judaism of his day. He talked about the name of God. In Matthew 6, 9, he talked about sanctifying the name of God or hallowing the name of God. When he talks about Alvinu Mokinu, our father, our king, he then says, hallowed be your name or sanctify your name. He wanted his, Jesus wanted his disciples to sanctify God's name in the context of the covenantal relationship they were in. And when Jesus taught this, we know that the background is seen all throughout the prophets because in many cases, God was upset that Israel was profaning his name, and God would talk about vindicating his name. When his name was profane, God said, I will vindicate my name. And so when Israel profaned God's name among the nations, God promised to vindicate his name. And so we today as Christians can profane God's name through our actions, character, and conduct. And so we need to remember that Jesus wanted his disciples to sanctify God's name. And of course, Scott McKnight says here in a very important quote, he says that no place have Christians been more insensitive to Judaism than when it comes to what Jesus believed and teaches about God. The God of Jesus was the God of Israel, and there's nothing in Jesus' visions of God that is not formed or inherited from his ancestors and what he learned from his father and mother. Also, the concept of righteousness, when Jesus teaches on righteousness, that had to do with Israel's covenantal relationship with God through the Torah. It had to do with wholehearted commitment to the Torah in the context of covenantal renewal. This obviously didn't have much to do with imputed righteousness that Paul talks about in Romans. This is a different context. So let's remember that when we think about righteousness. And then when it comes to the Shema, which is one of Jesus' main teaching, the two greatest commandments, you shall hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We know that Jesus is referring to Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 8, which mentions the Shema, the creed that all Jews would say three times a day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. These commandments I give you today are beyond your hearts. Impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. So as I said, this comes right out of Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 8. And the emphasis in the Shema is to hear, listen, and obey. Because in Jewish thought, in the Shema, hearing is related to taking heed and taking action with what you've heard, and if you don't act, you've never heard. So, for example, in Psalm 81, 89, Psalm 81, verses 8 to 9, there's an emphasis on hearing. We know that Jesus talked about hearing in his parables. So there's a big emphasis on first listening and then obeying. If you don't obey, you never heard to begin with. And so the test for spirituality in Jewish thinking is the actual action. It's when you carry out what you've heard. And of course, as I said in the two greatest commandments in Leviticus 19, uh, and love your neighbors yourself, that comes out of Leviticus 19. Not a new command that Jesus gives. It's right out of Leviticus 19 here about loving your neighbors yourself. 
and we know the context is broken down here. It talks about respect for parents, provision for the poor, respect for property of others, care for the physically challenged, justice for the powerless, kindness and language about others, and prohibition, prohibition of hate and vengeance. And finally, remember Jesus as a Jewish prophet. There's a very famous book called The Prophets by Abraham Joshua Heschel. He says here, to a person endowed with prophetic sight, everyone else appears blind. A person whose ear perceived God's voice, everyone else appears deaf. No one is just, no knowing is strong enough, no trust complete enough. The prophet hates the approximate. He shuns the middle of the road. And this means we need to understand this background because everyone believes Jesus was a prophet. Of course, he's more than a prophet. But remember this quote by Dan Cohn Sherbach, who is a Jewish rabbi, not a believer in Jesus, but he's written a ton of books. He's a reformed Jewish rabbi. He says here, like the prophets of the Hebrew Bible, Jesus can be seen as the conscience of Israel. In his confrontation with the leaders of the nation, Jesus echoed the words of the prophets by denouncing hypocrisy and injustice as a prophetic figure, this image of Jesus should be recognizable to all of us. And so we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. I hope this helped you understand the importance of the Jewish roots of Christianity and why your faith today needs to be understood in a first century context. I hope and pray that you simply don't accept your current ecclesiastical tradition without understanding the first century context and understanding the Jewish roots or Jewish background of your faith. Have a good day.